Tonight, a P-plate driver arrested, an aged care worker fighting for life after a shocking hit run at Armadale. Victorians rushing to fill the MCG for Shane Warne's final tribute. Eight men wanted over a vicious bus attack on two women in Melbourne's southeast. A push for free public transport as petrol and fruit and vegetable prices surge. A Chinese passenger plane in a chilling crash that has baffled aviation experts. And the Melbourne Grand Prix set to make history on and off the track. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. An aged care worker is fighting for life tonight in the hospital where she works after a shocking hit run at Armadale. The young woman was boarding a tram when she was allegedly hit by a pea-plater who drove off but eventually surrendered to police. Back at the scene, but this time in handcuffs. An alleged hit run driver handing herself in. Vanessa Sorensen was just metres away when the victim was hit. I heard a huge bang. I turned around. I went back and she was lying on the road. The 26-year-old woman was struck by this Tesla as she attempted to board a tram around 6.30 this morning. She was flung 15 metres along Wattle Tree Road as the driver fled. So I went over to her and she was barely conscious, uh, lying on the ground with a terrible head wound and a, a leg wound. The driver continued to her partner's home a short distance away. In a panic, she was brought back to the scene around two hours later. What happened? Tell us about this. Just a normal accident, why are you extricating that? No, we just can't know. What no, were the no, circumstances? No. Nothing. You brought her back though? Yeah, I what, brought her back. What did, ha, ha, what did it take to convince her to come back? Nothing. She no. was going to come back anyways. Was she, she was a bit scared, yeah. The tram had stopped at the time of the collision. There are six witnesses, including an off-duty nurse who helped care for the victim. The alleged driver has expressed remorse to police. Despite the fact they did come back, that will mitigate the circumstances long term in court uh, and reduces their moral capability. However, the fact that they didn't stop to assist uh, is an issue. Major collision investigators will seek to access camera vision and tracking technology recordings from the latest model Tesla. The victim, who is an aged care worker, had been on her way to work. And Chief Crime Reporter Cameron Bowe joins us now with breaking news. Cameron, the accused has just faced court. Mitch, police had opposed bail for Sakshi Agarwal, but it has been granted. The hearing was told that her car had been on autopilot and that she works for Victoria Police as a contractor. She's agreed to give up her passport as one of the conditions of her bail. She'll face charges including dangerous driving cause serious injury. Now the victim, Nicole Lagos, remains in a critical but stable condition. As an Alfred Health worker, she's now relying on the care of her colleagues, Mitch. Cameron Bowe at the Alfred Hospital, thank you. Victorians have already snapped up tens of thousands of tickets to Shane Warne's public memorial as new details emerge about next week's service at the MCG. Jade Vincent has the latest. Jade, tickets were made available this afternoon. Yes, Mitch, and more than 30,000 free tickets were snapped up by fans in just the first two hours of becoming available online. The plan is to fill up the northern grandstand of the MCG so that the crowd is facing what will be renamed the Shane Warne stand. Then more tickets will become available in line with demand for what is set to be a send-off fit for a king. Shane Warne set to move a packed MCG for the final time. Ah! Got it! There's Kane, um, beautiful man, no doubt about that, a fantastic friend. A lot of people didn't get to see the real you. The Premier confirming the State Memorial will begin at 7 o'clock, Wednesday, March 30. There's no COVID limit or anything like that. Uh, it'll be as many as we can... Uh, as many as we can get in there. The first allocation of free tickets was released at 3pm today with 10 minute wait times just to log in. Next week's service will also be live streamed across the country with Elton John, Ed Sheeran and Coldplay's Chris Martin expected to send musical tributes from abroad. Shane, I miss you so much. Can't believe you're not here. Mr Sunshine. Warney, a new documentary on the cricket great will air on Channel 7 tomorrow night. Saddened that your loss is a quick one, but 
you know, if we're all serious, I'm, I'm not sure if you'd have it any other way. Um, you live fast. We'll also hear publicly from Steve Waugh for the first time since Warren's shock death about a young spinner with a blonde mullet who'd changed the sport forever. It's the only time I've ever heard, but I actually heard the ball fizzing through the air. You knew there was something special about this kid. Jade Vincent, 7 News. Eight men are wanted over a vicious attack on three women on a bus in Melbourne southeast. Christy Cooper has the details, and Christy, one victim was left with a brain injury. She was, Mitch. Police have been unable to identify the eight men involved in this vicious assault, so they've released these images and asked the public to help them work out who they are. The group is accused of kicking and punching three young women, leaving one with a brain injury and a broken nose. It happened around 7.40 on February 26 on a bus from Dandenong Railway Station to Box Street in Doveton. The Chief Commissioner has described it as horrendous and cowardly. Mitch. Christy Cooper in the newsroom, thank you. 132 people have been killed when a passenger jet nosedived into the ground in China. The Boeing 737-800 crash has baffled aviation experts. It's regarded as one of the safest planes built and is the backbone of Australia's airline fleet. Plunging to the ground at an ungodly speed, the heart-stopping final moments of a China Eastern Airlines plane in a near vertical nosedive, bursting into flames on impact. <laughs> the domestic flight left Kunming bound for Guangzhou. It was cruising at just over 29,000 feet when it rapidly lost altitude. It stabilised at 7,400 feet, then hurtled to the ground. <laughs> Rescue teams sent in by the dozens found pieces of the plane in the rugged mountains, but no survivors. Whatever it was, it was a, a catastrophic event, uh, an airplane descending uh, that quickly out of the sky. Until investigators find the black box, the cause of the crash remains a mystery. The Boeing 737-800 is considered a workhorse of the skies. It's the predecessor of the 737 MAX, which was grounded after fatal crashes in Indonesia in 2018 and Ethiopia in 2019. Pilots are baffled and say these planes simply do not fall out of the sky. It was designed almost to be like the Model T of airplanes so that anybody could fly it. The backbone of Australia's domestic airline fleet and has been, has been for almost 40 years now. China Eastern's fleet is now grounded. Ashley Mullaney, 7 News. Russian troops are being accused of opening fire on peaceful protesters as the war in Ukraine approaches what NATO is describing as a dangerous stalemate. The West fears the slow progress could push Vladimir Putin down an even more dangerous path. Russian reconnaissance in the sky. Pictures it claims show Ukraine's military reloading missiles at a shopping centre turned weapons depot, allegations it used to strike with precision. And the impact is horrifying. An apocalyptic landscape where a bustling mall used to be. At least eight people dead in the most powerful explosion to hit the capital, Kyiv, so far. I don't feel safe anywhere in Ukraine, this woman says. Here's a new example of why. South in the occupied city of Kherson, a peaceful resistance is disrupted by their Russian invaders. Gunfire to scatter the crowds. Flash grenades. And chasing people through the streets, what appear to be armed Russian soldiers. Vladimir Putin's troops running like terrorists. Yet Russia still denies it's targeting civilians. Ukraine's president calls those Russian soldiers slaves, shooting at free people. This is what their towns look like in Kherson. The few residents left behind finally accept some through tears that they can't stay any longer. There's simply nothing left. Russian troops don't appear to be gaining significant ground, but are wiping everything they can off the map. What's happening in Mauri is a massive war crime. 
destroying everything, bombarding and killing everybody. Ukraine's military continues to boast about its fight back, but NATO fears a dangerous stalemate is fast approaching. He's already used chemical weapons in the past, and we should be careful about what's about to come. British defence analysts believe the Russian ground invasion has reached a critical point where only one major offensive can be maintained at a time. The focus right now, the besieged city of Mariupol. If it falls, Moscow can send resources elsewhere. Potentially Kharkiv and the capital Kyiv, where Russian troops appear to be digging in, leaving civilians picking through the remnants of their lives. In Lviv, Ukraine, Hugh Whitfell, 7 News. And Jeff Perry joins us now live from Ukraine. Jeff, there's now talk of a coup to overthrow Vladimir Putin. Yes, Mitch, most Russians get a very heavily censored view of uh, the war in Ukraine, but there are people who actually know what's going on. Uh, Russia's military command, which has been fought to a standstill, and the oligarchs, billionaires who lead lifestyles only you and I could dream of. Uh, sanctions have taken away their boats, their aircraft, their bank accounts, and it's thought the loss of that luxury lifestyle uh, might be an incentive for them to mount a coup against President Putin. It would be a brave move, but one they might be willing to take if they could extract Russia from this war. In Kiev, a lifestyle away from the Russian rich, there are just about 24 hours left on a curfew that was brought in there. It came in after that missile strike on the shopping centre, levelled the shopping centre, killing eight people. This Thursday uh, is four weeks since Russia entered the war, invaded Ukraine. President Zelensky has made offers of peace talks before. He's still, he's still waiting to hear from President Putin on his latest offer to sit down at the negotiating table. Mitch. Jeff Perry in Lviv, Ukraine. Thank you. Back home and the skyrocketing cost of living is showing no signs of slowing down, with some stores now pricing broccoli at more than $7 a kilo. Consumer confidence has plunged as wages struggle to keep up with the price rises. Almost $11 for a kilo of cucumbers, 13 for capsicum. The price of produce has skyrocketed. And that's if you can get what you want at all. Most of the damage, the severe damage, has been on the eastern, eastern border, on the coastline. Floods, on top of lingering COVID-related supply issues, mean the price of some vegetables has gone up by 75%. With broccoli now moving above $7 a kilo, and prices set to stay high for at least six months. More than ever, customers should be really well planned and take advantage of the offers. From tomorrow, Coles will cut the prices of its pork shoulder roast boneless to $8 per kilo from $10 and of its pork leg roast boneless to $9 per kilo from $11. Customers are transitioning to white meats and you know, affordable cuts of meat as well. Consumer confidence has plunged to its lowest level since September 2020 and many think things will only get worse. Inflation today is at 3.5%. Consumers believe it'll hit 6% within two years. Economists attribute our gloom to wages failing to keep up with rising costs. We know that petrol prices have a really big impact on people's expectations about inflation. But some hope. We do think that by the end of this year, real wage growth will be positive, and I think that'll be a big boost to consumer sentiment. Gemma Acton, 7 News. The Andrews government is under pressure to make public transport free to help Victorian families struggling with rising petrol prices. The move would cost billions, but transport experts warn it could do more harm than good. Traffic's back, petrol prices are up and the state government's been pitched a solution to help. They can do that by immediately making uh, public transport free uh, for the next month. Free for commuters, but it will come at a cost. We've estimated at the, the high level about $75 million. It's a balancing act, recognising that families are under uh, pressure, but also recognising that the state needs to secure sufficient revenue to provide the services that the community expects. Transport experts agree free travel would keep COVID-cautious commuters on public transport long term. 
By making services free, you'll increase ridership by about 20%, maybe 30%. Public transport in the outer suburbs, the ones most hit uh, badly by petrol prices, is often very poor and it's not really a good option uh, instead of getting in your car. We've been calling now for a while of uh, free public transport on Monday and Friday. The Premier today balked at the free transport suggestion, but is promising relief for families in May's state budget. Holiday-hungry Victorians will get another chance to snap up travel vouchers from tomorrow. 140,000 will be available as part of a $200 million stimulus package. We would expect 140,000 will be snapped up in a matter of minutes and we would expect uh, Victorians to travel all over the state. Chanel Vella, 7 News. Scott Morrison has labelled Anthony Albanese gutless, claiming he's dodging questions about a toxic culture within the Labor Party. The Prime Minister's attack comes as the Coalition prepares to hand down the budget and launch into campaign overdrive. Cuddling a koala... Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> ..and snatching a selfie... ..then catching a high-flying high-five... <laughs> and flashing a smile at a crocodile before bearing his own teeth. But what we've got from Anthony Albanese at the first sign of hard questions, he has gone into complete hiding. Frankly, I think it's pretty gutless. Three days and no news conferences from the opposition leader accused of not acting on the alleged bullying of Senator Kimberly Kitching, who died 12 days ago of a heart attack. He can't just dismiss away hard issues. Now, that's not what Prime Ministers can do. What this Prime Minister did today was lead a pre-budget announcement blitz $60 million to attract foreign tourists back and faster NBN for rural and regional areas. Labor announcing today it will bring down another budget before the end of the year, redirecting the government's spending towards its own priorities, all hinging on an important if. So if, and I, I appreciate that this is a big if, but if we win office in May... Labor's budget would fund free childcare, free trades training, climate and other priorities. His spending won't stop and that's why you can't trust Labor with Australia's finances. Mark Riley, 7 News. The Melbourne Grand Prix is battling staff shortages as it gears up to return to Albert Park for the first time in two years. Even so, it's preparing to make history with record demand and a new look track. Back on pole position after two years in the wilderness. Lovely that we're standing here because this day, about 760 days ago, this was where we had to cancel the event. The Albert Park circuit resurfaced for the first time in the event's history, with five new grandstands to cater for record crowds. Saturday and Sunday tickets have already sold out. We expect that we're going to have one of the biggest aggregate crowds in the history of the event. Both the Saturday and the Sunday to be in the 125 to 130,000 vicinity. Yep. GP organisers are promising edge of your seat viewing here at Albert Park. Two turns have been removed and five widened, which should mean more overtaking and much faster lap times. And if there's anything to go by, Ferrari's going to be up front and we're just going to make sure Daniel gets a bit quicker. Daniel Ricardo, not the only one needing a spark. Event organisers are facing staff shortages. Normally we'd have the recruitment of the workforce completed by now. What we're finding now is the recruitment is going to go all the way up to the event. Labour shortages are a real issue. Um, we wouldn't expect anything like what happened at the footy, but there's no doubt that, it's, uh, that, that, it, that it is tight. Sarah Jones, 7 News. There's a new injury blow at Essendon. Tim Watson, things have gone from bad to worse for the Bombers. They have Mitch, a star midfielder, is facing a surgery shock. We'll have the details in sport. Also, breaking news on Jack Revolt's fitness fight. Why? Brett Ratton has some early headaches at the Saints and one of the most spectacular catches you'll ever see from the Aussies. And Mitch, there's three cases tonight at the AFL Tribunal. We'll have live details very soon. OK, Tim, thanks very much. It was a crime that shocked Melbourne. Two men shot dead outside a Paran nightclub. Next, a trial hears a young man was kicked out of the club hours before the carnage. Also coming up, a costly lesson for an L plater in Melbourne's West. New technology to catch more drivers using their mobile phones. Changes to uniform rules to give girls a sporting chance. And later, how to talk to your children about Ukraine. Expert advice for parents.
A learner driver has crashed his car into a house in Werribee. The Mazda hit another vehicle on Tarnit Road before slamming through a fence and into the home. A mother and her son were inside at the time. Neighbours rushed to help. It was a massive explosion and there was just smoke up in the air and I ran from my house down here. And yeah, it was pretty horrific. I rang the police and the emergency services. The 17-year-old learner driver suffered minor injuries. He'll be questioned by police later. Secret phone taps from the home of an underworld crime figure will play a key role in the trial into a deadly drive-by shooting outside the Love Machine nightclub. Two men were killed when shots were fired into a crowd outside the Paran venue. A long queue was outside the Love Machine nightclub when Alan Farris drove a stolen Porsche past the entrance. Front passenger Jacob Elliott fired four shots into the crowd, killing two people and injuring three others. The gun was later found in Musa Hamka's bedroom. Their lawyers will argue neither man intended to commit murder. On day one of a five-week trial, Crown Prosecutor Patrick Burke told the jury they'll hear audio recordings from inside the home of Nabil Magni, a notorious underworld crime figure who was killed in 2020. His apartment was being bugged as part of an unrelated investigation. One of his sons, Ali Magni, called his dad saying he'd been assaulted by security guards at the love machine. I just got kicked out. These guards kicked the out of me. His father later tells him, move away from the venue. I'm telling you this for a reason. Can you get in a cab? Come to me. Hours later, Nabil's other son, Jacob Elliott, opened fire. Security guard Ahmed Khalid Osmani and Ker Arrow were killed. Tomorrow, the jury will be taken to the Love Machine nightclub. The Crown said it was important for them to understand exactly what they're looking at when presented with security footage. Christy Cooper, 7 News. High-tech cameras that can catch motorists using their mobile phones are expected to be rolled out across Melbourne after a successful trial. Legislation is being introduced this week, with the cameras expected to be rolled out by next year. Drivers face a $545 fine if caught using a phone. The technology could help add up to $1 billion a year to the government's coffers. Uniform rules are being overhauled in netball, swimming and cricket to encourage more young girls to take up community sport. A study's revealed body image can play a big part in whether girls are physically active. For these young women, choosing what they wear to training is a game changer. It will just make life a lot easier, I guess, getting into the pool. So being able to have a choice of wearing something that's a little bit more coverage is awesome. Victorian sporting codes, including swimming, cricket and netball, are overhauling uniform rules for female athletes. They'll no longer have to wear attire that makes them uncomfortable. Ones that aren't a unisex design or a boys de traditional boys design, but that are designed for girls. The style and type of uniform could change. That might be pants, a skirt or shorts. The changes follow a Victoria University study that found flexible uniform policies encourages ongoing participation in sport, makes girls and women feel happier and boosts confidence and enhances performance. Choice enables empowerment. Choice enables you to determine whether it's one or the other. It might be both, but to have that choice makes such a difference. There's now a push for schools to get on board so young female students can have a sporting chance. Sarah Jones, 7 News. Jane Bunn joins us now. Jane, it turned cooler and showery in Melbourne this afternoon. Rich showers are passing through and they should keep coming tonight and tomorrow morning. It reached 22 in the city before that wet weather arrived. Here they are, crossing the Melbourne area from west to east. Showers, so it's dry one minute, wet for a brief time, then dry and repeat. They are cooling it down, but the air is still humid, so it can feel warmer than it actually is, like in Watsonia now. I'll show you when the humidity disappears after sport. Rich. I'll be interested in that. Thank you very much, Jane. <laughs> Melbourne parents are facing a childcare nightmare with major shortages and soaring costs. Details are next on 7 News.
Also, intimate details revealed as Ben Robert Smith's mistress takes the stand. And Hamilton wows them in the street. The number of coronavirus patients in Victorian hospitals has risen again. 256 people are now receiving hospital care, eight more than yesterday. 24 patients are in intensive care, five are on ventilators. Seven further deaths have been reported. On a day we recorded almost 9,600 new cases. Most of the 53,000 active cases are the Omicron subvariant. There's a warning tonight, childcare fees could rise by more than $3,000 a year for families with two children. Centres are feeling their own cost of living pressures, which are set to be passed on to parents. Kirsten Aldcroft spends $30,000 on upfront childcare fees each year. I mean, that wasn't even both of them in full-time care. If we weren't getting subsidised, all my wage would be going into childcare. You still have to outlay a lot. Major providers Good Start and G8 Education have lifted their prices by as much as 6%, prompting fears the rest of the industry will follow. We do expect prices for an average family with two kids in childcare to go up $3,000. The price increases for most childcare providers are being driven by the cost of rent of where the childcare centre is, as well as the cost of staff, um, together with the cost of managing in a COVID environment. But it doesn't automatically apply to everyone. Parents should search for the facts rather than react to hypothetical fee rises. The broad brush fee of a service is not what the families pay out of pocket. The city is the most expensive area for long daycare. That's followed by Brighton East, Camberwell and Mooney Ponds, while Dandenong, Truganina and Narry Warren South have the cheapest. There's not much at the end of the week. The, the week or the month or the year. <laughs> More than one in three Australians now live in a childcare desert, meaning for every three children needing childcare, there is just one spot available. It's commercially driven, not driven by what's actually in the best interest of the population or where the population growth areas necessarily are. Rachel Ward, 7 News. Australia's Defence Forces will be expanded with a new Space Command to protect the country against cyber attacks. Defence Minister Peter Dutton warns China has the capacity to launch a digital onslaught from space. It's a domain which must be used to deter aggression rather than become a new realm for conflict. Australia will also launch satellites with the US and share surveillance information. Intimate details of Ben Robert Smith's romantic affairs have emerged in his defamation trial. His former mit mistress wept as she described how she hoped to marry him and how the VC recipient allegedly mistreated her. Awarded the highest military honour for devotion to duty, and today we heard of his devotion to a relationship outside of his marriage. His mistress, described here as Person 17, met him at a charity event. He started talking to me and we just started flirting. I spoke of the problems I'd been having in my own marriage. He was unhappy too. I feel like I can't leave, he said. We then went back to his hotel room and we had sex several times. The court heard they became addicted to each other. After a few weeks, I I said that I thought I was falling in love with him and he said, you don't want to fall in love with me. I'm not the greatest guy. We talked a lot about our future together, that we would get married. Their relationship, the court heard, was plagued by jealousy and mistrust. I got a pregnancy test. The result was positive. He told me, I'm going to want some proof. Robert Smith is suing nine newspapers after it implied he was a war criminal and violent towards his mistress. In 2018, Person 17 said she attended an event at Parliament House where she was accused of being drunk and flirting with dignitaries. She left the event and fell down the stairs. Back at the hotel, he was pacing around, getting angry. He punched me. I ended up lying on the bed and I just lay still because I didn't know what he was going to do next, she sobbed. She will continue giving evidence tomorrow, where she will be questioned by his lawyers under cross-examination. Leonie Ryan, 7 News. The cast of the hit musical Hamilton has performed a street show for hundreds of fans outside Her Majesty's Theatre. The Broadway blockbuster has its Melbourne premiere on Thursday. Melbourne fans of Hamilton have waited a long time for their shot. Do you remember the 
The Smash Hits cast performed a medley of songs from the show. hundreds of excited fans outside Her Majesty's Theatre. The minute we knew there was going to be a ham for him, like we all just went, we're skipping school, we're coming. <laughs> I promise I'll study tonight. It's like, whoa, they're like standing right in front of me. The support from fans blowing the cast away. There's something about Melbourne and I think that the show was just made to be here. We haven't really had an opportunity to integrate and sort of talk to the fans and, you know, say thank you. Hamilton broke box office records in Sydney, selling more than 250,000 tickets before its first preview, an unconventional fast-paced musical. It uses hip-hop to tell the story of America's founding father, Alexander Hamilton, averaging 144 words per minute. Tickets are on sale for Melbourne shows until August. Rochelle Brown, 7 News. Melbourne dog owners are being warned to be on alert after a spike in the number of poison baits in the suburbs. Details are next on 7 News. Also, how to talk to your children about troubled times. Expert help for parents. And quick thinking strangers to the rescue in a crash emergency. New video has emerged of a dramatic rescue after a car smashed into a pole in Cranbourne last August. Shit. Ruby, stay in the car. Do not get out of the car, OK? Do not get out of this car. Video posted to the dash cam owner's Facebook page shows a man risking his own life to drag an unresponsive driver from a burning car. He gave first aid until paramedics arrived. The driver survived. Miners have helped the ASX climb higher today. Here's finance editor Gemma Acton. Thanks, Peter. A strong session for our local market with the ASX 200 today hitting a two-month high of 7,341 points. Miners, including BHP and Rio Tinto, outperformed. That's as global commodity prices took another leg higher. The Aussie dollar has slipped back. It's now buying just under 74 US cents. While oil prices jumped sharply overnight, that was on news the European Union is getting closer to a ban on Russian crude imports. And by January, household spending was almost back to where it was in January 2020, before the pandemic. However, spending on some categories, including transport and restaurants, still has a lot of ground to make up. Peter. Gemma Acton reporting. Social media is fueling children's anxiety over world issues like the Ukraine war and the pandemic. Young Victorians have access to unfiltered pictures. Now experts have tips on ways parents can monitor what children see. Like so many children, Jake Higgins and his younger brother Ben are watching the horrors of Ukraine play out on social media. I just fire the bombs and then you can hear the screams of the children. It's not very nice to watch. While the siblings know they're far away from the war, they're concerned about the future. And they could nuke the whole world and yeah, I don't want to be like nuked. Mental distress a major issue for children and adolescents. We're looking at this cumulative effect of, you know, pandemic and bushfires and uh, war, floods. It's hard for kids to make sense of. UNICEF urges parents to listen to kids' concerns, explain the truth in an age-appropriate way, shield young children from distressing scenes, use a map to reinforce distance and let children know that kind people are helping Ukrainians. Make a donation to a charity. They might then feel a lot more positive that they've been able to help. You can't hide the fact that there is a war around, so you have to talk about that. Parents are encouraged to monitor their children's social media. It's just wrong. Like you don't need to go to war. Like, like if you look at how much land he has, it's just insane. Like he wants more. Jackie Quist, Seven News. Spot on there. Dog owners are being urged to take extra care after a spike in the number of baiting incidents across Melbourne. The city of Yarra issued a warning after one pet ate a baited piece of meat at Richmond's Annette's Place Reserve. There have also been reports of baiting around South Yarra. 
Sport is next with Tim Watson and Tim One AFL Club had a harsh review today. Yes, Mitch, we'll tell you the coach who's delivered some stinging feedback to his players' exclusive details next. Also, relief for one Tigers star, but another will be sidelined. The latest bomber is set for a lengthy stint on the sidelines. A special visit for the Magpies while Mason Cox is troubled at training and Ash Gardner gets some air to pull off an incredible catch. Welcome back. Saints players have been served a harsh reality check from coach Brett Ratton at today's review. Mitch Cleary has the fall at Atmarabin. And Mitch, you've got some details of some early home truths. Well, Tim, Brett Ratton and his coaching staff have wasted little time delivering strong feedback in the wake of that surprise loss to Collingwood on Friday night. Individual efforts were called out by Ratton and his team. The Saints hoping it can draw a response starting this Sunday when they travel to play Fremantle. The Saints staring down an 0-2 start to the season. Paddy Ryder won't be there for the second consecutive week. He's uh, playing on modified minutes in the VFL after a pretty quiet training session this morning alongside Dan Hanabry, who will again be held back. His VFL chance, his VFL return to chance next week, Hanabry, meaning he's likely to miss at least the first month of the AFL season. Jack Billings put through a big session today, but he's been ruled out again given his recent recurrence of hamstring setbacks. At Carlton, another day of training, another day of no COVID positive results. Really good news for the Blues, meaning it's just Jack Martin missing against the Dogs at this stage. Coach Michael Voss won't be there, but it's expected tonight. The Blues saying they will be drawing on that AFL option of having him dialed in to the coach's box. He'll be there in more of a support role, Tim, for that role that Ash Hansen will play as the stand-in coach. Thanks, Mitch. The Bombers have been dealt another cruel blow just days after their thumping loss to Geelong. Carl Langford's hamstring injury is much worse than first thought, ruling him out for months. Kyle Langford didn't seem bothered heading into the hangar yesterday, but scans have now confirmed his hamstring injury isn't a regular strain. The club saying he'll consult a surgeon and could be sidelined for up to 10 weeks. But round one rising star nominee Nick Martin is ready to pounce after his five-goal debut. Signed just weeks ago, persistence paid off for the 20-year-old. There is other avenues and opportunities to get to the AFL, so I just hope people might see my journey and keep at it. At Collingwood, Mason Cox was limited to the bike at training and is in doubt with an ankle injury, although scans have ruled out significant damage. Jordan Roughhead's still up to five weeks off a return from shoulder surgery. It's disappointing not to be out there and enjoy it with the guys, but it's great to, to see him playing good footy. After a bruising encounter for Darcy Moore, he managed to train fully today in front of 87-year-old Pies diehard Jim McPhee, who's been a fan since he was six. Scott is a great player and probably at this stage my favourite. If I live longer, maybe someone else will be captain, but uh, I don't know whether that'll ever happen. Laura Spurway, 7 News. Richmond's round one fade out could see a shake up to Damien Hardwick's midfield plans. Andrew McCormack has more. And Andrew, there's good news though for an injured Tiger. Tim Dion Presti's latest hamstring setback is on the minor end. He was back running today at Punt Road just five days after he went down with another soft tissue injury. He could be back yeah, for the Tigers as soon as round four against a big game against the Dogs. Jack Rewald had a plate inserted into his thumb. He'll miss this week but could be back as soon as round three. Jack there with that thumb bandage after surgery. Now Shy Bolton was clearly sore after the warm-up today. He talked to the medicos pointing to his groin. He trained away from the main group and completed some running but one to watch potentially later this week. The Tigers fans, they were overrun on Thursday night against the Blues. This is their centre bounce attendances across the game. Shay Bolt, Bolton rather attended just nine centre bounces. Shane Edwards just four, both playing in a more forward role. Both of those averaged 13 centre bounces per game last year. So certainly something that Damien Hardwick might have to look at in terms of uh, getting some more grunt in that engine room. At the Tribunal tonight, Rory Sloan free to take on Collingwood. His one-week ban for eye gouging has been downgraded. Willie Rioli, the second of three, came tonight just in front of the tribunal as we speak. He argue, he's arguing he's made unavoidable contact with Matt Rowe. That one, a real test case. Lots of AFL players watching that one to see how it pans out, Tim.
Yes, indeed. Thanks, Macca. To Cricket Now, and Alex Carey and Cameron Green have wrestled back the ascendancy for Australia on day two of the deciding test against Pakistan. Kerry was lucky to survive this Yorker, which grazed his off stump. He and Green both posted half centuries and went into lunch unbeaten with the Aussies five for 320. Usman Khawaja battled stifling heat and illness on day one to fall just short of another test century. I was really struggling to be out there and I was, I was just telling myself, just keep going. I wasn't feeling well at all, so um, yeah, mind, it was more of a mind game for me. Steve Smith's test 100 drought continues. He was out LBW for 59. Ash Gardner has pulled off one of the catches of the Women's World Cup against South Africa. Deep mid-wicket. Is she in play? Oh! Ash Gardner, outstanding. One-handed, over ahead. Captain Meg Langin uh, produced a magnificent unbeaten century as the Aussies chased down the 272-run target with 28 balls to spare to remain undefeated. The hits keep on coming for the Socceroos, with Tom Rogic ruled out of the crucial World Cup qualifiers against Japan and Saudi Arabia with an ankle injury. Meanwhile, Graham Arnold has copped a $25,000 fine for breaching COVID isolation rules. He still needs to return a negative result to rejoin the team ahead of Thursday night's clash. And there's concern for Ben Simmons with a return to the court still unclear. It's been revealed the Aussie star has a herniated disc in his back and required an epidural last week. There's just 11 games left in the regular season. Simmons is yet to debut for the Nets. And Mitch, that could be very painful, that sport. Yes, it can be. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. Jane is next with the forecast. And Jane, what's in store for tomorrow? Well, Mitch Showers, they'll gradually clear out, but we'll feel the wind as it has a bit of bite. The full details are next. Tonight at 10.45, as it happens, live to Ukraine for every new development in the war-torn nation. Urgent investigations underway. What happened to the China Eastern flight live to the region? And new predictions for Australia's soaring rental market. Join me for the latest from 7 News at 10.45. Hello again. We've had a showery afternoon that's tending to more persistent but still light rain, mainly in the northeast this evening. The city reached a top of 22 after a low of 18. Outside now, it is still 19. It's still humid, but that humidity will drop tomorrow morning, letting overnight temperatures drop too. The showers began over southwestern parts of the state as they are spreading through. The radar looks more exciting than what is actually reaching the ground. In the west, it hasn't produced much, hasn't produced much that adds up in the rain gauge. However, an area of severe thunderstorms developed over eastern Victoria in these yellow areas. You can see it's gradually moving eastwards. Now, if you're directly under a severe storm, it can bring damaging winds and flash flooding. Now this does not include Melbourne, however Bansdale, Orbost and Bright are currently at risk. The thunderstorms are further north of that area too, but not severe around Wodonga yet. Troughs are connecting with tropical moisture from severe cyclone Charlotte. That's why it's still humid even though it's turning cooler. But a cold front crosses Bass Strait tomorrow morning. That'll bring in a change. In behind that front will be breathing air that has come up from the southern ocean. No more air from the tropics. The storms continue to be a risk in these parts of the east tonight, while just showery or light rain for the rest. It clears tomorrow and we're left cooler and feeling colder. With no humidity, the wind will feel chilly. But the warmth, it isn't completely over. It'll come back again over the weekend. Around the nation tomorrow, wet weather moves up the east coast while the southeast settles down. Lots of showers for Sydney, they'll ease in the morning for Canberra. Hobart turning dry during the morning, dry all day in Adelaide. Warmth and sunshine for both Brisbane and Perth. Perth may get rain from the remains of that cyclone on the weekend after a very dry summer. 
To Victoria, the storms ease by dawn and tomorrow just light showers in the south and on the ranges. They're generally clearing in the afternoon. The north is all dry and the wind is a bit fresh. Closer in, showers continue mainly over northeastern suburbs. They should have generally dried up by mid-afternoon. Otherwise, sunny breaks in there, but the wind feels chilly. So by the morning, there is no more tropical humidity. The wind will have some bite. There is the odd shower about, otherwise dry with a mix of sun and cloud. It's a top of 19. To the eight-day outlook, it should be dry for the rest of the week, but without that humid air, our nights cool down. By Wednesday, by Thursday, it's 12 degrees to start, top of 20, 22 on Friday. Across the weekend, 24, then 29, bright sunshine. We'll have some showers developing on Monday, a cool change into that. We might get some showers later Wednesday too. Just 19 tomorrow, starts on 15, and it cools to 12 tomorrow night, so completely different. We've got this chill in the wind, and showers about it. Away with the tropics. Indeed. Thank Go you, on. Jane. Now here's what's on Sunrise tomorrow. Thanks, Mitch. Tomorrow on Sunrise, a special health investigation. The two simple tests that could stop surprise heart attack deaths. Plus the new look supermarket, how it's changing the way you shop in a very big way. See you in the morning, Melbourne. And that's the way it is this Tuesday, the 22nd of March. Thanks for your company. For now, from the Seven News team, good night.